Well, I'll give you guys a kind of an overview of the Kemper County project. As you've probably heard some of it, then you uh, don't know how closely you've been following it. But uh, give you a little overview how things work, some pro project statistics, and then we'll uh, move on into the update so you can see where we are right now. And hopefully I can figure out how to work this. It took me probably about 20 minutes to figure out how to put my name tag on today. So uh, yeah, we're kind of hurting here. So, But it's a ni nice way I don't have to put a hole in my jacket. All right. For those of you that aren't familiar with IGCC, I thought I'd start off with a little diagram that uh, illustrates the Kemper County uh, plan in particular, but it, you could apply it to a lot of uh, IGCC units out there. And I don't want to mess this up. Is the red button the laser, or is this going to turn everything off? Okay, just make sure I'm good. Okay, so we'll start off. Uh, for those of you that don't know, IGCC stands for Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle. It's a new type of way to generate power from, from coal. Uh, gasification's been around a while. Uh, it's only been recently that people have shown a whole lot of interest in taking coal and converting it to syngas and using it in a combustion turbine in place of natural gas. So that's basically the gist behind IGCC. Kemper County features the TRIG technology, and the TRIG technology is, uh, stands for Transport Integrated Gasification. It features the transport gasifier uh, that was developed by a southern company and uh, KBR along with uh, our industrial partners such as DOE. So we'll go over the Kemper flow diagram. Basically we take the coal, at Kemper we use a lignite, and I'm not sure, and we'll take it, we'll crush it, and dry it. Lignite's pretty high in moisture. It's about 45%, higher, a lot higher even than PRB. So we'll dry it down to about 22%, something you guys are probably a little more familiar with. Pulverize it down to about 250 microns. And then from there, we'll feed it through a high pressure feed system into our gasifier that operates about 700 PSI and about 1800 degrees. In the gasifier, you've got an environment that's uh, devoid of oxygen, so that provides the right environment to convert the coal into syngas. In the process, you also generate uh, a gasification ash. Uh, some's a little coarser, some's a little finer. The coarse ash remains in the gasifier. We can pull it off as it accumulates. The fine ash leaves with the syngas. Therefore, we have to filter the syngas before we send it to the combustion turbine, otherwise you, you destroy the combustion turbine. So we cool it. And as we cool it, we generate steam. This steam will supplement any steam we would produce in the heat recovery steam generator, and it, it really helps the bottom line of the plant. It can per half the steam comes from the uh, gasification section of the plant, and only half from the heat recovery steam generator in the combined cycle. <clears throat> then we go through a, a barrier filter. They're candle filters that will filter the syngas to down to less than part, 0.1 parts per million of particulate by uh, weight. That's less dust than what's in this room right now. And operationally, you're okay to send it to the turbine at that point. However, this is where you have your unique opportunity to clean the coal before you combust it, since we have the coal in a gaseous form. So we're gonna go through a few steps. And I know Jenny mentioned the water gas shift reaction. It's been around a long time, but basically what we do there is we run the syngas over a catalyst and the water in the syngas will react with a carbon monoxide in the syngas to produce hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide. Uh, and then we can take out the carbon dioxide to have a high hydrogen gas to go to the turbine so that most of what you're emitting is just water vapor and nitrogen out of your stack. So you can see here the water gas shift reaction. We go through some cooling and go into our CO2 and sulfur removal. We call that the acid gas removal section or AGR of the plant. And uh, here we use the Selexol solvent that's licensed by UOP. It operates at a cool temperature about 40 degrees. At that point, uh, the Selexol will absorb the carbon dioxide and the sulfur. The sulfur goes to the WSA process where we convert it into sulfuric acid. The carbon dioxide we put in a carbon dioxide compressor, pressurize it up to 2100 PSI, and it goes in a pipeline to be used for enhanced oil recovery. The syngas continues and goes to the mercury removal step and then back through the other side of several of the heat exchangers to heat itself back up to about 450 degrees before it goes into the combustion turbine. There we produce our power as we expand the ex hot exhaust gas over the blades. The gas is still warm at this point, so we, uh, we generate some extra steam from our heat recovery steam generator, and that supplements the steam that we produced in the sea and gas cooler. And this, in a nutshell, is the trig process that's shown at Kemper, so you can kind of see what we're doing here. 
I also want to emphasize that some of the key differences, the core technologies, these are, the, uh, these are some of the technologies that we've developed with Southern Company KBR that are a little different than most other gas fires, including the gasifier, the coal feed system, and the particulate collection uh, device. Uh, it, was, it was developed originally by uh, Siemens Westinghouse, and we've kind of taken it and improved upon the design. Since the gas fire is so critical to the operation of the plant, I want to talk about it for a few moments so you can see the difference between the trig gasifier and the other gasifiers. You've probably heard of several of these companies, uh, GE, ConocoPhillips, Shell, Siemens, and Mitsubishi. These are all big industrial giants, most of them in the energy business. Uh, most of these gasifiers were actually designed to operate to make chemicals from coal first, and power generation was kind of, a, kind of an afterthought. They can do it, and they can do a decent job at it. However, we prefer the trig gasifier, and uh, one of the reasons is we designed it, but secondly is it was designed with power generation in mind. All of these first four here primarily operate in oxygen blown operation, which is great if you're making chemicals, uh, perhaps not necessary, but it's, it's a good step to do because you get a concentrated syngas. It's not necessary with power generation. In fact, a lot of these, when they make their syngas, they have to blend it back down with nitrogen to keep from overheating the turbine. So instead of running a big energy intensive uh, oxygen separation plant, we just let the, the nitrogen pass through the unit. Uh, secondly, the, and probably a bigger difference as far as you guys are concerned, is that these operate at higher temperatures. Temperatures so high that the ash comes out as molten slag, and it's often difficult to deal with it. It also requires more extensive materials of construction, and they have higher heat losses as a result of operating at higher temperatures. Uh, it turns out the coals that we wanted to focus on with the transport gasifier include uh, Powder River basins, lignite, subbituminous coals that have more reactive materials in it. Uh, that these are suited particularly for power generation, and uh, really lower temperatures are suitable for uh, getting that uh, adequate carbon conversion from these. So that's another good reason to use the tree gasifier. A little bit more about the gas fire. I mentioned the moderate gas temperatures. We can use less expensive materials of construction, which means it's just simply refractory line steel pipe. So kind of like a concrete sort of layer on the inside to keep the heat in, and then the steel liner on the outside. In addition, we don't have to generate slag. The ash leaves as a powder. I mentioned the air blown design. In addition, we've developed our own uh, high pressure coal feed system that doesn't require it, you to mix water and slurry it into a high pressure gasifier. We uh, use a series of airlocks and a, a patented system we developed to kind of blow the uh, coal into the unit as it meters it in. And that's really good, of course, if you're feeding a lignite or a PRB, it's already got a lot of moisture. Lignite, we have to dry it first. PRB, you probably wouldn't. but. Uh, you, you still don't want to add a lot of water to dilute your seeing gas if you don't have to. We have good long refractory life. We've done a lot of testing at our pilot plant, and uh, the pilot plant's actually a lot worse on the uh, refractory than, than we anticipate the uh, full-scale facility because there's more thermal cycles for all the testing we do there. And we expect an easy construction scale up, but since this is just based off of the fluidized catalytic cracker, and some of those are very, very large units that are out at refineries. So now that we've talked a little bit about the fundamentals behind the trig process, I'll talk about uh, Kemper County in specific. And you can see it's located right here in Kemper County, Mississippi. Has anybody ever been to Mississippi? Yeah. There's a few, there's not a lot of reasons to go unless you know, you're working there, I guess. It's not really a tourist destination, but uh, like Jackson Hole is, but uh, it's almost as pretty, not, no, not really, but, <laughs> but it's a nice place to live. Um, but basically, it's right here on a lignite seam, and this slide drives me crazy because this has really got the right side. This is a little too far north. We're a little further down right there. But it's right there on the lignite seam. There's actually a large seam of lignite that runs through Mississippi, and it's, it's just perfect for what we want to do. You can see sort of the uh, composition here. It's actually pretty high moisture, a lot higher than what you're used to with PRB, I'm sure, because it can run up to 50% moisture. So it's uh, pretty low-grade stuff, and we don't want to transport it because of that. So that's why the plant's where it is. Uh, you can also see your sulfur content. I believe that's a little higher probably than what you're used to seeing as well. So that means, you know, we, our sulfur removal system is a little different than what you might see at a PRB plant. This is a two-on-one unit, which in natural gas combined cycle lingo means we've got two combustion turbines and one steam turbine. So all the steam in the plant gets funneled to one steam turbine, but we have two combustion turbines. At our plant, each 
combustion turbine is supplied by its own gas fire and gas cleanup train, and you can't crisscross them. They, one goes to one and one goes to the other. So uh, that's what we've got there. And uh, we're capable of generating up to 582 megawatts uh, net. That is net, the gross is more like 830. Uh, the uh, 524 on syngas alone, then we can put natural gas to our duct burners, which basically heat up the Herzig so we can get a little extra power out. It's not as efficient to do that, but if it's the summer and you get in a bind and need a little more power, you can do that. The heat rate, if for those of you that follow, uh, think of efficiency in that term, is 12,150, which equivalates to about 28.1%. Uh, and you might say, well, that's not all that wonderful, but Keep in mind that we're dealing with coal, it's over 45% moisture, and we're also capturing 67% of the carbon dioxide. Uh, I don't know that there, if you tried to have a lignite plant and you tried to treat the carbon dioxide at the stack at a, at a pulverized lignite plant, that you'd even have any power left to put to the grid, because that's, that's a lot of work to have to take all that out. Uh, we use the Selexol process, I mentioned that earlier, to remove both the hydrogen sulfide and the CO2 and we will capture about 65% of the carbon dioxide. Uh, we will be controlling that to try to achieve 800 pounds of CO2 emitted per megawatt hour, which means it's on par with the uh, most efficient natural gas uh, combined cycle plants as far as the amount of CO2 released per megawatt hour. So you can't really complain that we're any dirtier than natural gas. And in some ways our sulfur may be even cleaner than a lot of natural gas uh, facilities do the selects all process. It gets a really good cleaning. Mississippi Power is the owner and operator. They're a subsidiary of Southern Company. And uh, of course, Southern Company, we're working very hard with them to uh, get things up and running. And over time, we'll gradually pass the baton to them. Um, the, the commercial operation date, you're probably very interested in this. You may have read this in the papers. Um, we anticipate to go online the first half of next year. And we're on target for that right now. Uh, the combined cycle, however, is already in service on natural gas. It's running right now. Uh, well, actually, we're in a little outage now for uh, a turbine check, but it was a scheduled outage uh, where we knew we were going to come off. It's fall, and we're not making a lot of, we're not, the demand's not as high right now anyhow. We are a zero liquid discharge facility. That's an interesting fact, which means no liquid water leaves the plant. Everything has to be reused within the plant. And if we need makeup water, that comes from a big pond we have with uh, treated effluent from the City of Meridian sewage treatment plant. So uh, we've got a big lake out there full of this stuff. It's been treated. They tell me it's as clean as the water you drink, but I just don't know if I, well, maybe not quite that clean. Clean as the water out of a stream, but I don't think I would want to fish out of it or anything like that. Although I've heard there's fish in there. Some people say birds bring fish in there or something, and I don't know, but I wouldn't fish out of it. Uh, I'm sure it's clean. Uh, <laughs> But uh, byproducts, this really helps the plant bottom line. We'll be producing 3 million tons per year of carbon dioxide. And we've already got contracts with two, not one, but two different off-takers. Uh, and, you know, you may not get a lot per ton, but when you're making 3 million tons of anything, it adds up and it really does help the bottom line of the plant. Uh, sulfuric acid, we'll be producing about 140,000 tons per year of sulfuric acid, which can be up to two trucks an hour, depending on uh, the sulfur in the coal. So we're gonna, we have a drive through for the trucks to come through to constantly be pulling that out. Ammonia, we'll be producing 22,000 tons per year of anhydrous ammonia that we'll be marketing down on the Gulf Coast. So that's little factoids about the plant. So where are we? You're probably wondering, well, what happened to the plant? Is it even finished or what, what's happening? Uh, well, basically construction is pretty much complete. I, I would love to say 100% complete, but we still have construction on site to help out with little things, cleaning out lines, pump strainers, that sort of stuff, if construction encounters a problem, little punch list items. But so what I'll do, I'll say it's over 99% complete. All the major equipment's in place, all the piping's in place, all the big stuff's there. And here's a good picture of the plant. This was back in July. You get a really nice look at the gasifier structure here, the select saw unit, the sulfuric acid plant, the nitrogen plant, and the combined cycle, the coal dome off in the background, and the combined cycle cooling tower and the gas fire cooling tower. Uh, it actually, I wish I could use a better picture because there's a little bit of scaffolding right here where they were finishing up the insulation on the SO2 converter of the sulfuric acid plant. But uh, it's all off now, it's looking pretty good, but I didn't have a picture that was more recent. And here you can see a few more pictures of the plant. You can see all the insulation we've got going on. 
But as I mentioned, the construction is pretty much complete, and we're very proud of our uh, recordable incident rate was 0.46, seven times safer than the construction industry standard uh, with, uh, average, which is really good for a first-of-kind facility, and this is something a little different than uh, we built anywhere else in our system. So now we're just doing commissioning support with construction, punch list items, putting on the insulation and doing some painting around there. We're, we're pretty much complete. I want to point out, the, some, we have some really big valves there. This one, that's like a job box there, so a person may be about this tall off the ground. So you can see we've got a lot of big things to insulate. It takes a lot of time. Uh, here, this is some of the superheated steam piping off our steam gas cooler. It uh, looks like something some pretty futuristic there. More pictures, the AGR you can see complete, and here's more of the plant here with the gasifier structure, the AGR, and then the combined cycle. Sulfuric acid plant, you can see everything's painted, ready to go, and then there's the actual plant with the tanks in front of it. The little drive-through areas behind that. And this is inside the cold dome. It's actually uh, fully operational. Commissioning, okay, so what, does everybody, what did everybody do once construction was over? Well, you can't just start operating the plant. You, there's, you gotta clean things out, you gotta make sure things work like you expect, and you gotta do pressure tests, to make sure that everything's safe and mechanically complete, and dot all your I's and cross all your T's. So that's what's been going on lately, and it's nearly complete. We've done most of the clean outs. We've done all the air and steam blows, hydrolazing. Hydrolazing is where they take a water lance and they go in and clean out the, any of the pipe scale of rust that may have formed in the pipes. We, we want an ultra clean facility. We've got uh, the flushes and chemical cleaning for our heat exchangers. That's nearly all complete, just a few small areas left. Uh, the pressure tests are also mostly complete, especially on all the large equipment, such as the AGR you can see in this picture. All this has been pressure tested in one big loop. The gasifier has been pressure tested from the gasifier all the way through the whole syngas line. Uh, in addition, ash silos, sulfuric acid plant, the lignite feed systems. We have a refrigeration system on site too, and that's to uh, chill the select saw. It has to operate at 40 degrees. We had to do a vacuum and a pressure test on that. Since we, we use ammonia, we have to put pure ammonia in there, so we're gonna have to pull a, a vacuum as, as tight as we can on the refrigeration system. That's already been tested, and once we're ready for the ammonia, we can uh, start loading it. Uh, some of the more complex things that commission is involved with are putting some of the internals in the vessels, such as these columns here. You, can, you see these people up here on the side, and I, they're better people than I am. I, I don't think I could do that. But um, they're loading internals inside of these columns. These columns are full of rashy rings, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they, basically there's all these little rings. They're, they range from about an inch to an inch and a half. They shape like little Ws, but the main purpose behind these is to get good mixing between the liquid and the gas. If you uh, just had open vessels, the water would go down the sides and the gas would go up the middle and you wouldn't get good mixing. You have to get good mixing. And uh, it's actually more complex than that. You have to get the right number of bags in each vessel. If it's off a little bit, you're afraid that you've either got a void or you might have compressed your packing. So uh, you got to do that right. And uh, there are hundreds of bags of these rashy greens that had to be put in all these columns. That's been completed, and we're actually working on degreasing them right now because they come with cutting oil on them. Uh, filter elements. There are several filters throughout the plants. The big ones are like the particulate control device on the the uh, syngas line. We've placed all those in service. We've also done the same for the lignite prep area and the cyclonic bag houses. Uh, not everything's a mechanical type of work though for commissioning. We also have our INC guys, uh, the instrumentation and controls guys, doing loop checks, making sure that the signals go from the control room out to the field and back. And we also are doing a detailed logic review to make sure the logic's robust and uh, uh, easy to follow and easy to work on if we ever need to make any modifications. And then I've got a few pictures here to show you. I've been installing the uh, filter elements in the cyclonic back houses. There's six of those, so all this they have to do six times. The syngas coolers, uh, we had to do degreasing on those. This is just before that. Here's some of the temporary piping that was put in place to, to blow out the lines with steam. Our refrigeration compressors, we've got eight of those. Uh, this is basically uh, the refrigeration system we had to pull the vacuum and pressure test on. And here you can see several of the rash, this is by no means all, they took up acres when we had them out there on the field, but this is uh, uh, some of the rashy green bags that were put in this cart and lifted up to the columns so that they could install the rashy greens inside of the uh, vessels. 
Uh, in addition uh, to commissioning, training is also an important thing. We want we are a PSM facility, so which means process safety management. Since we have a, such a large quantity of ammonia on site and uh, flammable gas, so we want to make sure the operators get all the training they can, and they'll be prepared as possible for this. Well, there's no other plants to send them to. This is a first of a kind facility, so we had a company develop us a model and we hooked it to a complete copy of our plant DCS so that when the operator sits in front of the simulator it looks just like they're in the control room. In addition, uh, the DCS being our control system from what the operators operate with. Uh, in addition, we have an SIS, a second control system. It's an emergency shutoff in case there's any problems. So we had a complete copy of that put on the model as well and a complete copy of the Siemens controls uh, for the turbines. Uh, they have their own logic control system, and then there's a model that totally replicates the uh, turbine. This will be the first time these turbines are placed in syngas use. Uh, in, this, the instructor station uh, will allow the instructor to, he can freeze the model, he can run the model, he can backtrack, he can run scenarios, he can fail valves and make sure the operator knows how to respond. But this has all been huge. We've gone through several startups and shutdowns with the simulator, and we, it's been pro proven not only useful for training operators, but it's been hugely valuable for evaluating our procedures, our, our control system graphics in the control room, and also for uh, evaluating our control logic. It's, uh, we've, there's a lot of things. Logic look good beforehand, but it's hard to evaluate every scenario you see until you go through a complete startup and shutdown. And the only other alternative to having a simulator would have been to wait till you actually get there and start up where you could encounter delays. This has all been done, and we have a nice, robust system that can handle uh, most any foreseeable scenario. And you can see some of our findings here on the right. And going forward, this will uh, serve as our operator training platform. This just shows how many tests we went through uh, to improve the model. This, this, this system's never been modeled before. We've never accurately modeled uh, the transport gasifier in real time, though. We've done it, we've done it on uh, slower calculations, but they're too slow to hook to the plant DCS because it, it may take 10 minutes to get a, a solution. We had to be able to do things that would operate real time. Every second, it's got to recalculate. So uh, over time, we refined the model, improved it, and we tested out all our systems. Meanwhile, back at the plant, functional testing was going on, both with the logic where we did a functional test on the uh, startup burner, coal mills, coal dryer fans, and WSA burner to make sure everything operates as we expect uh, as far as the signals and the uh, burner control management systems were concerned. And then we've actually moved on into air and nitrogen circulation tests. This is the closest thing to operation you can have before you actually go into operation. So we've actually blown uh, air all the way through the gasification loop from the compressors through the gasifier and all the way uh, to the turbine through all the gas cleanup systems. So uh, we've been able to do that to tune the valves, both for the pressure control, flow control, and make sure things are as we expect on the gas side. Done similar tests on the coal mill loops. They have their own closed loop. We just haven't put the coal through it yet, but we have circulated the nitrogen through the mill and the fluidized bed dryer. And that's what you're seeing here is the fluidized bed dryer that uh, we use to use low grade heat from tempered water, it's only about 250 degrees to dry the coal from 45% moisture down to about 22%. The select saw unit, we've done similar exercises where we circulated water through the unit. It's a liquid-based system, so we've done those, and we've actually switched the water out and put our soap in. We've degreased one of the uh, sets of columns, and we're going to the next one. Test fired the flares. You can see a nice picture here. I came outside one day, and that was going off, so uh, that's, that's my photo there and uh, the WSA, we've actually run air through the whole unit, which is our sulfuric acid plant. Tempered water system, we've completed the circulation tests on that. That's the system, it goes throughout the entire plant, picks up low grade heat and sends it to the cold dryers for drying. And, we've, and it has steam heat for startup, we've tested that out, it worked well. Water gas shift, that's where we transfer, switch the CO and water and turn it into hydrogen and CO2. Well, we've had to go through our circulation heating test. You have, the problem with the water gas shift is it's got catalysts in it, and you don't want coal seam gas to hit the catalyst. So this is something you do during every startup. You have to run through a nitrogen heating section. We've already tested this out. It's ready to go. Coal, filler, coal feeder filling cycle. We've gone through all the, the tests with that in a dry cycle mode without the coal in it. As you can imagine, you're probably wondering how we get atmospheric coal into a 700 PSI reactor. Well, basically what we have to do is use an airlock system. It's got a bunch, several vents and uh, pressurization lines, and we've gone through the cycles and they all work well. 
The logic's very complicated on it since it's a sequence. It's actually more logic in one coal feeder than in the entire combined cycle. So that was a big undertaking to get through all that. And we've commissioned several of our compressors. Here you can see one of our process air compressors. We have, seven, I mean, we have four on site. Each one's 27,000 horsepower. Down here you can see our coal feeder. This is the bottom vessel that's pressurized. And this is kind of showing you a schematic of the entire loop. Basically, I take atmospheric coal from this bin, go through this little carrot-shaped vessel here that pressurizes it and drops it into the feed vessel. Now, several of the, uh, of the systems are actually already fully operational. We're getting really close to startup. So this kind of gives you a list of everything that's operating as it will uh, when we're processing the syngas. The combined cycle is up and running. The nitrogen plant is running. You can see right here, here's our nitrogen plant with its air compressors, coal box, and distillation column. Uh, our wastewater plant, and DMIN plant, instrument air, steam, the lignite development facility, uh, delivery facility, I should say, mill reject removal system, and the auxiliary boiler are all, all fully functional. And here's some pictures of that. The wastewater plant, I mentioned we have to recycle all of the water we generate in the plant and reuse it. The only water that leaves the plants through the cooling tower vents. And then there's inside the coal dome. A little better picture of the switch yard, and then here you can see the entire coal delivery area. We've got a huge pile over here, it's ready for us to use. And basically these conveyors can take it to the dry storage, the outside storage, or up into the unit, the tripper floor, to feed the crushed coal silos. And that's fully operational. Uh, here's a view of the combined cycle from the front. You can see we're venting off steam as we start it up. Here's our water treatment area. And this, this might be interesting. This is our construction village here. That board walk through there is a third of a mile long. So that might be of interest there. And now commercial, not only are some of the systems fully operational, they're actually commercial and making us money right now. Uh, the natural gas combined cycle has actually been in service for over a year, started on August 9th last year, and we've generated 3.5 million megawatt hours. Of course, the goal is not to run on natural gas for long. I mean, uh, the full goal is to get on syngas, and we hope to do that shortly. Uh, our E4, that stands for equivalent forced outage rate, it's actually about 1%. That's five times better than... Uh, you, than typical for similar systems of, of the natural gas combined cycles of this size. So we're really happy about that. That's going to give us a good foundation for when we put syngas to the unit. And this is a diagram kind of showing you all the, be, all the uh, assets that are in complete commercial service. Some of these are the buildings, the admin building and all, but you can definitely see the combined cycles here and the switch yard, electrical building, water treatment, and then our natural gas pipeline, treated effluent pipeline from Meridian, in our water storage pond. So now what's next? What's, what's left to get this thing up fully operational till we get to commercial operations with coal in, in the picture? And basically we're getting really close. We're really close. All we need is just really a normal plant startup. But instead of starting it up over three or four days like you could normally start uh, the gasification unit up, or actually that's a conservative estimate, uh, we're going to take a few months and do it slowly and characterize everything. Make sure we're going slow and we understand that uh, and verify our design. We're going to start with uh, uh, starting solid circulation in the unit. This is supposed to start next week. We'll be charging the unit up with solids and start the fluidization nitrogen and get it circulating. This is how the gasifier operates. We have to circulate solids through the unit. After we get the operators familiar with the, the operation and we confirm the hydrodynamics and we have no reason to think there will be a problem, we're then going to light the burner. And then we have to heat up the unit slowly, allow the solids to transmit the heat throughout the unit as we slowly cook off the water that's embedded within the refractory. If you do it too quickly, you'll damage the refractory. So the key is to go very slow here the first time. When we're happy with uh, our thermal aspects of our gas fire, we'll then start cold feed. When we get hot enough, we'll inject coal into the unit. And from then on, instead of, develop, instead of emitting uh, the uh, release, uh, instead of flowing flue gases out of the gas fire will be flowing syngas and we'll be flaring it upstream of the gas cleanup unit. When the gas cleanup units are brought online, then we will divert the syngas and start capturing the carbon dioxide, the sulfur, and the ammonia. And that uh, goes into commissioning our byproduct uh, generation, such as our sour water system and our WSA and our CO2 compressors. 
And then finally, we'll uh, admit the syngas to the turbine after some characterization tests. And then uh, once we finish it, we get to do it all over again on train two. So uh, we hope to do that, have that finished. Right now, we're on target to finish first half of next year. And so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. That's uh, where we are with the, with the Kemper County facility. Well, thank you, Oops. Thank you Matt. Uh, it, it, you've come a long ways. Uh, I should add that uh, the, the Infrastructure Authority, uh, some of our board members, I, I see Lloyd's in the back of the room. Thanks for joining us today, Lloyd. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, a group of us went down to uh, Kemper and, and the National Carbon Capture Center in July, which is a lovely time of year to visit oh, the Deep right. South. <laughs> it's good to be here then. <laughs> you need to come now. It's nice now. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll keep that in mind for next time. Yeah, fall's so, the time to go south. <laughs> but, but we really appreciate this update. You've, you've clearly come a long ways in the, in the last two months since we've been down there. But with that, I've got some time for some questions here. So. Yes, sir. Thank you, Matt. I'm Stephen Flint with the Jackson Hall Center for Global Affairs. Um, Could you run us through the economics a little bit, uh, Matt? Um, uh, of course, there have been unanticipated cost overruns. Um, and the costs of these projects, the capital costs, are very expensive to begin with, as we all know. Um, there was another power company, AEP, that took a run up to some of these technologies, as you know, in West Virginia uh, a couple of years ago, and then backed away from it when it became clear they were not going to be able to pass the costs on to the consumer. My understanding from some of your colleagues is that uh, Southern has made the decision to eat those capital cost overruns, not pass them on to the consumer, and to move ahead with the project that you've just described. Uh, I wonder if you could walk us through that decision process, which led to a different outcome than AEP reached, uh, and how you see the cost recovery over however many period of years you project it will entail. I will do my best on that. I'm, I'm more in the technical field, so economics are not, or project controls aren't really my strong suit. I will say this, uh, a lot of the cost associated, uh, cost overruns that you've seen with Kemper, and of course everybody's always disappointed when, when you have cost overruns. A lot of those, uh, and it wasn't any one thing. There, there's been several things it's, that's just added up, to be honest with you. It's not, there's nothing wrong with the design or the technology. It's just uh, a lot of it's, the first of a kind sort of experiences. You learn things and you have to react to that. And, and then there's just sometimes you just have some issues come up. But uh, I will say Southern Company, however, is very committed to the project. And they've uh, recently uh, told us that, you know, they, they're very committed to it, they would do it again. They feel it's very important to keep all of the different fuels in the energy mix. They don't want to go completely on natural gas. If we, if we did not build the Kemper facility, likely it would have just been a simple a natural gas facility there, and Mississippi Power would have been uh, vastly dependent on the price of natural gas. And right now, natural gas prices are really low, and it looks great, but the plant's scheduled to last several years. And uh, uh, I guess the original design's 40 years, but most of our plants last much longer than the original design. And who knows what natural gas price will do then. The company also is willing, was willing to push for this to give us a future for coal. It, it's very important that we keep that in the mix. And that's why you see us building the nuclear plant in Georgia as well as this. Um, they want to keep the portfolio broad. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really tell you exactly the issues that led to the cost overruns. We've got groups that are working on that, and they will be they issue statements from time to time. The full story, you know, you know, once everything's complete, I'm sure we'll know. I suspect most of the issues would most of the issues that I'm familiar with are first of a kind type cost, and you wouldn't you would see a dramatic improvement on the second plant. And that's that's kind of uh, the philosophy behind why you want to go forward. 
Tim? In your, in your production of this plan, is it at the right size to be economically built up for the next one and the next one? Are you going larger with more production? That's a very good question. Okay, so the size of this plant was dictated by the turbine. And uh, it's being a uh, 830 megawatt gross, that's totally dictated by the turbines we had available. And you can adjust the size based on the different turbine models, but we felt like this gave us economically the best, uh, not just economically, but the need for power fitting with this turbine size. And so we selected it and that's, that's where it came from. So you're kind of, you kind of are dictated with the turbine this because the system's married to the turbine. Do you know, we do have, there are numbers out uh, right now, and unfortunately I'm not prepared to, uh, to give that. However, there are public release numbers that a quick Google search would, would tell you what the, the latest number is. And they've been very good about releasing the numbers, so whatever you have will be accurate. It, it, it'll be more accurate than what I know, because all I know is what's in the, the public release uh, uh, documents. And I, I'm scared to say a number because I may not, get the one that's out today, <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid that's all I could do. do. Do we have one last question? Oh, Dave. Yeah. We may have a couple here. Okay. But just on that, I mean, there's obviously a lot of pressure, um, and if you're going to shoulder the cost of that, what has, what, what's the shareholder reaction been, and, and how has that been? Uh, that's... I'm not as involved with the, the public relations side. I know there is a misconception, I know, in Mississippi, because the ratepayers, they, they see their bill going up, but that's only for the original price that was get, agreed upon, and Southern companies taking everything beyond that. So the ratepayers seem to be, they don't understand that necessarily, because they're not having to pay for any extra cost beyond that. As far as the shareholders are concerned, I have heard very little, I'm not, I'm not the one to really ask about that, but I have not heard any major concern. I think most, and generally, uh, I know the CEO, and from what I can tell, the board seems very committed to the project, though. So, and, uh, but yeah, it, 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 it's not the most comfortable thing ever to whenever you have any cost overruns, but, uh, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not anything we can't overcome. I'm afraid that's, that's about all I can say because I'm not really involved in that, that, that side of the company. I just want to, again, echo Laura's comment about for your leadership, you know, to take something like this, first of a kind, work through all the uh, re-engineering fixes and all that is huge, and it's, it's a necessary step. You know, we deal with a lot of different technologies and finding someone who will be willing to be that serial, serial uh, n number one plant uh, is more difficult than I think the technical aspect sometimes. You can always get, oh, well, you know, I'll join a third, fourth one, that kind of thing. Uh, but I just want to share when we toured there that uh, some of the information we get so if people look up the price is when you look at your total cost numbers you see and calculate dollar per kilowatt, that includes that you bought a mine and all the mine equipment and facilities included in that price. You built a large CO2 pipeline to deliver CO2 to the market. So there's a lot of things in that cost, so when you finally have that detailed breakout, uh, it'll be a lot different. And you're also, right. I think, what, what 60% of your revenue is from all those co-products. That's right. Not electricity, so it's so you, it's hard to compare it for just a pure electric power plant comparison. So it, when people look at that, you know, factor those in, and I think we heard at least a 30% cost reduction potential due to learning curve, both on yes. Southern and all your suppliers. So because of this, what you've taken, I think the value and that learnings that you have uh, advanced is, is a huge, huge value in those learnings. So thanks for all you guys have done. Well, thank you, thank you. I hope to see a lot of these, I hope to see one of these using PRB coal sometime soon. <laughs> thank you. All right.
Thank you, Matt.